My favorite TV shows, man, the Sports Center, ESPN News, Pardon Interruption, um, Around the Horn, um, quite frankly, um, Outside the Lines, uh, 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 Baseball Tonight. You know what I mean? I watch sports, dog. It's basically, that's what I'm trying to say. I watch sports, man. That's what I'm into. Sports, sports, sports. Every sport. Hockey, golf, basketball, football, of course. Baseball. You know what I mean? I got a favorite team, a favorite player in every single sport. I'm not going to answer those questions. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. If you didn't know, you are listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University's student radio station. I am your host, the one and only Addison Taylor, to provide you with an array of sports topics today, as we usually do. I hope you're enjoying your day so far. However you're listening, from wherever, why ever, I really appreciate you. We're going to keep going with the show. We've been covering a lot of topics this week on last week as well. March Madness is here. NBA playoffs are starting as well. MLB is approaching. We have a lot of different things going on, folks. So I hope you've been getting your sports fixes this is uh, this week. Quickly before we go into um, picking up where we picked off on um, last week's show as well, which March uh, March Madness and things like that, I wanted to go over some of the most recent games that are coming up for the Sweet 16. Um, first, let me say that my brackets are done. They're finito. They're kaput. They're done. Cooked, line, and sinker. Folks, I had Villanova going all the way. Um, you know, don't, 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 don't put so much pressure on me, okay? A lot of people have been discussing my bracket um, amongst work and other things. So, you know. Everybody's not going to pick the Florida Gulf Coast to go to the championship. You know, a lot of people didn't pick them last year, Wichita State, other teams. So, you know, just because your bracket is successful, there's a, a couple of successful picks made, it doesn't make you a sports guru. So I just wanted to put that out there to begin with. But, yeah, just to start, you know, my brackets are completely done. If you had Kentucky still in it, you're good to go. Some of these matchups, folks, are very integral when it comes to the tournament. Um, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this West Virginia and Kentucky matchup. I don't know exactly how that could prevail. Um, both of those teams are very good. Um, we have Kentucky and West Virginia. We have Notre Dame, Wichita State. We have Oklahoma, Michigan State. We have NC State and Louisville. We have Duke in Utah. We have Wisconsin and my favorite, UNC. We have Xavier, Arizona. We have UCLA and Gonzaga. Honestly, folks, heading into the Elite Eight, there's going to be some tough matchups right here. I'm going to start with this first game between West Virginia and Kentucky. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because this is going to probably be one of the toughest matchups for the Kentucky Wildcats just because of West Virginia, what Coach Huggins is doing, and the big lineup that they have. They're sitting on 25 and 9 right now. Fifth seed, they were 11 and 7 in the Big 12. If you look at their stats, folks, they're not particularly great. They don't stand out in any really big shape or form, but they get the job done. They're 36th overall in points per game, 73.9. Rebounds per game, 57th. 50th in assists per game with 14.5. But the thing for West Virginia that's going to be key is their height and their ability to match up with the length of Kentucky. Willie Colley Stein, Carl Anthony Towns, the Harrison Twins, Booker coming off the bench, Marcus Lee coming off of the bench as well. It's going to be very tough for West Virginia to do some of the things that they usually do on the defensive and the offensive end. But I think whoever wins this game is going to be the team who can keep their opponent to a low-scoring game, really like we've seen with the NC State win, um, even with, you know, UCLA and their win the other day, it's going to take an all-around team effort for them to really, you know, put together a good overall game to compete with Kentucky. The thing that's scary about Kentucky, folks, and the reason why I'm going to pull for them and go for them in this game is because they still haven't got premium play from their guards yet. Really, everything that Kentucky has done this season has been predicated off Carl Anthony Towns, and him emerging into that number one pick over Jaleel Okafor. We know what Willie Colley-Stein can do. 
And, you know, that's why I'm not so hard on Coach Calipari, and I feel like people give Coach Cal a very bad rap. He does develop players when they choose to stay. If you look at Willie Collie Stein and his game when he first arrived, he was a premium dunker, some sort of a, a shot blocker, but he wasn't smart with his shot blocking. He was fouling a lot. He wasn't going straight up and doing the, you know, the appropriate things to get the correct calls. But if you look at his game now, he's definitely someone who I see has developed into an overall and really a, a good post player. I saw him make a couple of post moves the other night that I had never seen him make before. So the thing for me with Kentucky, I love West Virginia. I've always been a fan. They always seem to be consistent in the Big 12. But the thing for Kentucky, if they can get premium play from the Harrison Twins, meaning, you know, maybe 20-point games, 15-point games, double doubles all around that's that's going to be scary for the rest of the field folks because Kentucky is a team who can really do some things and get running and a lot of their you know their heavy leads in the game are being made off of turnovers and things like that so it's key for uh, coach Huggins to address his team before the game and let them know to not be scared you know, um, I think a lot of teams are going into the Kentucky game already feeling minuscule compared to Kentucky. But I think, you know, they're definitely, um, you know, somebody who can, you know, who can get it done. They have Jay Staten averaging 14.5 points per game. He's a kid that can definitely ball. D. Williams is averaging 11.3 points per game. The rebounding factor is where they're going to need it. They're going to need Jay Holton to get those six point or six rebounds per game that he's been getting, maybe jump that up to 10. D. Williams at his 8.2 rebounds per game, that's going to have to go up to 10 or 15 because we know what Kentucky can do on the boards. I, I just don't see anybody really taking them down. This is going to be a game that's taking place tomorrow, the 26th at 945. CBS, um, you know, if you look at Kentucky, I mean, the 29th overall, 74.9 points per game, 21st in rebounds per 38.2, 42nd in assists per, uh, per game with 14.7. So I'm just looking at these last couple of matchups, and, you know, I don't see really where Kentucky can really falter. You know, D. Booker is averaging 10.5 points per game. Andrew Harrison is averaging 11.3 points per game. Carl Anthony Towns and Willie Colley Stein are both averaging around seven rebounds per game. Um, you know, half of that coming on the offensive, more so coming on the defensive. So, you know, if Kentucky can get Tyler Eulis, D. Booker, and the Harrison Twins to play a phenomenal game, I definitely think that they can surpass West Virginia, even though West Virginia will probably prove to be one of the most formidable matchups for Kentucky. So as far as that game goes, folks, I'm going to pick Kentucky on that one strictly because of their height advantage and because I feel like their guards haven't played quite up to their potential yet. I'm going to stay in the Midwest division. I'm going to talk about Wichita State and Notre Dame. Wichita State is the seventh seed right now coming in at 30-4, and 17-1 and one in the Missouri Valley Conference. Notre Dame is a third. 31 and 5, 14 and 4 in the ACC. They had a couple of big games this year against Duke, and they had a, a you know a couple of faulty games as well against the same Duke Blue Devils. For me, Wichita State's success is all about Baker and Van Vliet. You know, they're, they're averaging 15 points per game and 12.7 points per game. I think that Wichita State can definitely beat this team, and I'm not just saying that because of their success in the tournament thus far with beating Kansas 78 to 65, um, also beating Indiana 81 to 76. You know, they've definitely had some wins against some quality teams thus far. But for me, I think Wichita State is really hungry to not just be one of those teams that everybody talks about from the Missouri Valley Conference and one of those sleeper teams that everybody wants to pick, you know, as one of the, I guess, you know, best teams from one of the worst conferences. I definitely think Wichita State is here to make noise and actually make a run. And with that and that alone, I'm going to pick Wichita State over the number three ranked team in the tournament, Notre Dame, just because we've seen Notre Dame fold under pressure in certain parts of the season. So I feel like if Wichita State can continue to do the things that they've been doing with their press, I think their press is phenomenal. I think the 131 defense that they run is phenomenal as well. If they keep running those things to a high degree and can create some turnovers, 
you know, Notre Dame is a team that we know and we understand. It. Well, if you if you watch them and cover them like I have, you understand that when they start to get down, when they start to miss shots, Notre Dame, you know, their play weighs heavily on their body language. You can see it throughout their players. Um, you know, when they really start to go downhill, they go way downhill. So, you know, that's why you some you know, you could either see you know, a Notre Dame blowout of Wichita State or a Wichita State blowout of Notre Dame. I don't think it's going to be anywhere in between. Um, you know, to me, it's easy to say, and I can easily agree that Wichita State has some of the best guard play in the tournament right now. Um, you know, if you look at what Ron Baker is doing, you know, six foot three, two 222 pounds. He's a junior. He's been here before. Um, you know, and he knows what to do. He's averaging 15 points per game, like I said. And it, it's really going to be on the shoulders of Ron Baker and Fred Van Vliet, who's also a junior, six foot short guard. But this guy can flat out ball. He's averaging 13 points per game, like I said, roughly five rebounds per game, close to six assists per game as well. So they're going to need an overall game from both of those guys to beat this Notre Dame team. And for Notre Dame, they just have to be cohesive on offense. They have to keep their morality up during the game as well um, and keep fighting. You know, sometimes they get down and they seem to lose it. But if you look at Notre Dame, when they're on, man, they're on. They're averaging 78.8 points per game. That's 12th overall. Really, folks, what's going to get really get you here is this key number, their field goal percentage they're 51% from the field, folks. That's second overall, which means they're literally making half of the shots that they're taking. For me, I'm just scared with Notre Dame that when they get down, they start to live and breathe by the jump shot and three-point shot. So if they can somehow, you know, get a low post game started, um, you know, get get Jay Grant going, um, you know, it's going to it's gonna definitely take, you know, Jerry on Grant, that 17 points per game, it, it's gonna it's gonna take senior guard play to lift Notre Dame. I'm not saying they shouldn't be here. They're a great quality team, but I think Wichita State is just a team that's on a mission right now, and they're a team that won't be denied. So on that standpoint and that standpoint alone, I'm gonna go with the number seven ranked Wichita State over Notre Dame in this sweet well heading into the Elite Eight in the Midwest. Quickly, I want to go NC State and Louisville. Honestly, folks, to me, I'm riding with Louisville right now strictly because I had them going down to Northern Iowa. We know what NC State can do. I know NC State is a team that can definitely beat Louisville. Louisville is a team that can definitely be beat. They're usually up and down with their play. They're either playing very good or playing very bad. But I love what Montrez Harrell is doing. I love what he's been doing all year. Terry Rozier is a player, sophomore averaging 17 points per game if he plays at a high level folks Louisville can literally do whatever they want to do offensively it's when he lacks when he starts to make careless turnovers when the body language and the head starts to go down and the pounding starts to create itself that's when Louisville really they just they just start to you know become very dysfunctional as an offense um, we know Montrez Harrell somebody he can step back and hit the three-pointer if he needs to he's definitely a high flyer He's definitely a skywalker. We know he can jump. He's averaging 16 points per game. He's averaging 10 rebounds per game. Where they need Terry Roger to do, they need him to get his assist from that 2.8 to maybe 5 for this game. Turnovers are going to be key, folks. Both of these teams are, t are, are teams that, you know, create a lot of buckets off of turnovers. For me, you know, NC State, they're coming off so much hype right now that you almost can't deny them. I mean, they beat LSU by one point. They beat the number one team, uh, or one of the number one overall seeds in the tournament, 71-68 to 68, on the 21st of March. So you really cannot deny NC State at this point as a, of a team that could possibly go to the Elite Eight and even a Final Four, depending on the correct matchups that they get. Um, for me, I love Trevor Lacey. Um, you know, he's a junior guard. 16 points per game, 6'3", 210. He's a big body. You know, I just, I hope that NC State can compete with 
the speed of Louisville. To me, this matchup here is like a fin- it's You see the speed team in Louisville, and then you see the finesse team in NC State. NC State is a team that's just going to bully you. And that's what they did to Villanova. They just bullied Villanova. They just beat him to the boards. They beat him to the 50-50 balls. You know, the turnover ratio was definitely in their favor. You know, I especially with, you know, Virginia and, and them going down the way they did to Michigan State, NC State, Louisville, UNC, the rest of these ACC teams, uh, Duke as well, they need to – it's definitely a time to make a statement that the ACC is still one of the most dominant conferences, if not the most dominant conference in NCAA men's basketball today. Um, we know that the ACC has longevity in the tournament. NC State coach Mark uh, Godfrey, he discussed with his team and really the improbable run they made to the Sweet 16. But on that note, he needs to also let them know that there's definitely room for improvement, um, especially within his key players. So I think if he can get them you know, to really buy into what he wants to do against Louisville, um, you know, we know Louisville is a team that can be broken. Um, we know that Patino is one of the greatest coaches of all time, one of the greatest living coaches today, still coaching. Um, but, you know, I, I'm teetering on this, folks, because I, I almost want to go back and forth with my picks. But here, I'm going to go on a whim and I'm going to switch up what I was going to originally say. And I'm going to go with the number eight seed NC State over number four Louisville. Um, you know, in the eastern part of the bracket. And that's, you know, that game will be played on the 27th. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be played in Syracuse, New York. It's going to be a big-time festival game. I, I just really think NC State, you know, coming off that hype, I think they're definitely going to take that momentum into this game, and I'm hoping they can be productive with it. Um, next in the east, we have Oklahoma, Michigan State. You know, I'm going to I'm going to – really not go in on this topic as deeply folks because I'm such a fan of Michigan State and Tom Izzo when it comes to tournament time because they almost turn into a different team you know I I love you know how Izzo you know treats and commands his teams throughout the season because it's really you know it's almost like they do whatever they do during the season if they make it to the tournament which they usually do they always make the same kind of miraculous run so on that note I love what Oklahoma's doing, you know, 24 and 10 on the season, 12 and 6 in the Big 12. They got the number 3 overall seed. You can't beat those things. You know, that's great for their basketball program. Um, you know, that's great for the magnitude of recruiting coming in for next season and things like that. Um, but I just can't go against Michigan State at this point, especially how they beat West uh, excuse me, how they beat Virginia on the 22nd. Um, that score was 60 to 54, but at the same time, I think it could have been blown open a little bit more, folks, if you've watched the game and you get what I'm saying and you cover the sports like I do. I definitely think that Michigan State is a team who can make a Final Four run. Um, I feel comfortable that meeting up with NC State or Louisville in the next round. And, you know, on that note, I love what Oklahoma is doing. I can dive into the statistics of them as well. Um, I have them all in my brain, but. Here, folks, I don't think it's needed. I'm going to stick, um, I guess be a little cliche here, but I'm going to go with Michigan State just because of what they always seem to do in the tournament the last five, even, you know, ten years. You know, Tom Izzo seems to always be on the same page with his players, and I entrust them. So I'm going to go there with that pick. Duke and Utah easily pick Duke. Duke has been a team that just kind of seeming to be really run it, running away with games. Um I don't really think they've been 100% challenged yet. They beat up on San Diego State pretty badly. 68-49 to 49 was that score. Um, Utah beat Georgetown, which I actually had Georgetown beating them in my bracket. I keep discussing my bracket, and I, I don't need to. Um, I just I don't see Utah really matching up well against Okafor um, and those boys. Winslow's playing phenomenal. Quinn Cook. Um, you know, he's playing like the senior guard that he is. You know, he's really playing for success on the next level as well. And I know that he wants to win an NCAA championship. He'd love to go out with a bang. So even being a North Carolina fan, I'm going to ride with Duke on this one. UCLA versus Gonzaga, folks. Wow. That is a matchup that's going to, that's very tricky for me. Um, you know, UCLA is coming in as the 11th seed, 22 and 13 on the season. 
11 and 7 in the Pac-12, not the best numbers. We know what number two Gonzaga has been doing, 34 and 2, 17 and 1 in the WCC, uh, lost, you know, lost to, Bay, uh, to BYU. Um, but, you know, that's really about it. But, you know, to me, man, you know, in UCLA is really making a lot of noise right now. Norman Powell, 6'4", senior guard, trying to go out with a bang as well. He's averaging 16.4 points per game, five rebounds, two assists, which aren't the best. Um, but, you know, he is a, a guard forward, you know, scoring guard forward. So we know what he has to do. For me, I love the length of UCLA. I think they're going to match up well with Gonzaga. But the thing is, Gonzaga just hasn't really been able to be knocked off of that high horse just yet. You know, we've seen them be down to BYU in the second matchup. We've seen them be down to a couple of other teams, um, you know, during their um, you know, prospective conference tournament and the regular season as well. Um, but, you know, the height of Gonzaga's big man and their big man plays definitely developed as the season has gone on. But so has with UCLA. I mean, you see, um, you know, their quarterback for their football team, Mr. Hunley, was, you know, on ESPN a lot yesterday. And that was predicated off of the success of the UCLA Bruins in basketball in this tournament. I don't think anybody expected them to go this far, especially being in a, an 11th seed and losing almost 15 games on the season. But, you know, Bryce Alford is averaging 16 points per game, five assists per game, six foot three. They have some height on the boards there. Um, they're big men, Looney, Parker. Um, you know, that's they're going to need big play from those guys. You know, Kevin Looney is a freshman, 6'9", 220. He's averaging about 12 points per game. 10 rebounds per game. Um, those are very, very good quality numbers. But, you know, Gonzaga, we've been talking about these guys all season. You know, we we know what Wilcher could do. We know what Pangos can do. Um, but, you know, you can't forget about, you know, DeMontis Sabonis down low. He's also a freshman, but 6'10". He's averaging 10 points per game, 7 rebounds per game. So, you know, I really entrust Gonzaga right now because I don't feel like they want to be one of those teams that goes out so early. But at the same time, I understand that their success is going to be on the shoulders of Kevin Pangos. He's the senior. He's the leader. He's averaging 12 points per game, five assists per game, a measly three rebounds, but he's a point guard. You know, I don't. This is going to be probably one of the best games, I think, folks, of the Sweet 16. We have some great matchups across the board, but as far as the best games go, so far that Kentucky-West Virginia matchup is phenomenal. But this UCLA-Gonzaga matchup is going to be very integral for the tournament because whoever wins this, I think they're going to have a not an upper hand, but you know some great momentum and a big key going into whoever plays Duke. Um, you know, in Houston, Texas, in that South region. <sighs> this is really tough for me, folks. It, 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 it's really tough. I'm looking at the PPG, um, you know, between both the teams. Gonzaga is averaging about 80 points per game. Um, as of lately in the tournament, they've been keeping it around the, you know, 80s and 90s. UCLA is only averaging 72 points per game. But, you know, they beat UAB 92 to 75, you know. So we definitely see that they can put up points. And for that reason alone, folks, I'm going to go with the Mitch. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to say. But for this one right here in the South Region, folks, I'm going to go with UCLA over Gonzaga. And we'll fully discuss that game after it happens. Next, we got Xavier in Arizona. I don't really see Xavier keeping up with the speed of Arizona. They play that up-tempo game. They beat Ohio State pretty handily, 73-58. to um, Xavier barely beat Georgia State, 75-67. to So on that note, for the game that's going to be played tomorrow at 10-17, I got I to gotta handily go with Arizona on this one. I think it's going to be easy pickings for Arizona going into that next round. And they will face the winner of Wisconsin and UNC. In my bracket, I have UNC over Wisconsin. 
just because I think UNC, if they play the same similar game that Maryland played against Wisconsin when Maryland beat Wisconsin at home, when they had a big play from uh, Des Wells, you know, they were very consistent. They were very streaky. They won the 50-50 ball game, the loose ball game, rebounding offensively and defensively. I think that if UNC can crash the boards, really really idolize their big men down low, I don't know if um, I've been hearing some word that Meeks might not play for UNC. Um, that's definitely, you know, going to be um, a key matchup for them just because you know we haven't really been seeing the best play from Marcus Page lately but if they could get some good play from Bryce Johnson like they have been lately Kennedy Meeks um, JP Tokido as well you know I definitely think that they can keep up with this Wisconsin team because we've seen you know, if they can, if UNC can pass the ball, if they pass the ball correctly and rebound correctly, like they did in the Duke game where we did lose, you know, but at the same time, that probably was one of our best games of the season. So, you know, we know what Bo Ryan's Wisconsin team can do. They're a very old school team. Um, they'll, you know, they just kind of, they could just kind of straight up punch you in the mouth, you know, and make you play to their style. They slow the game down. They get Kaminsky the rock. But they don't particularly assist that well. We know what Decker can do. We know what Kaminsky can do. We know what Neal can do. Um, but, you know, I, I think if they can hold Kaminsky, who's averaging 18.2 points per game, Sam Decker's average at 13 points per game, Neal Hayes around seven rebounds per game, you know, I definitely think that UNC can, you know, win this game. Do I think it's going to be handily? Not at all. You know, I think. Whoever controls the boards on this game, whoever has the highest um, assist to turnover ratio, will be the team that wins this game. So on that note, and this might just be strictly predicated off of my thoughts and off of my, um, you know, own personal identification of North Carolina with them being my favorite team, I'm going to pick North Carolina over Wisconsin folks in the West Region in L.A. Um... You know, that game will take place tomorrow at 747, and we'll see. But as far as my picks here on Q&A, I have Kentucky moving on against Wichita State in the Elite Eight. I have NC State moving on against Michigan State in the Elite Eight. I have Duke moving on against UCLA in the Elite Eight. And I have um, excuse me, UNC going against Arizona. So those are my picks here, folks, and we'll fully discuss those. Um, some of the games that take place tomorrow, we'll discuss those on the show on Friday. And we'll also have Mr. Chase McFadden, a.k.a. Lord Helix, on Friday as well. So if you've been um, awaiting you know, his return, it will be made on Friday, folks. Really quickly, as we jump to our next topic, I just want to let everybody know you are listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University student radio station. And now you know. There's been a lot of discussion, folks, in the National Football League with some new rules being approved by NFL owners. And I want to touch on that subject very, very quickly. Um, just because, I, you know, on Q&A, that's what we like to do. We discuss um, an array of sports topics like they do on mostly the other shows that are out there, but we discuss them and we talk about them from a newer perspective, a younger perspective from the younger generation, future world leaders, um, whatever, what have you. The NFL owners, the National Football League owners, have okayed changes for safety and replay. The owners approve the new safety rule, folks. NFL owners have voted to prevent another Julian Edelman situation. For those who watched the Super Bowl, the Patriots' Julian Edelman appeared disoriented after a big hit in the Super Bowl by the Seahawks' safety Cam Chancellor, but he stayed in the game and eventually scored the game-winning touchdown. This new rule will give a third party power to stop a game if a player appears disoriented. So the question here, folks, is do I agree, do we agree 
with this new medically approved rule or not. The league announced that the owners voted to allow a certified athletic trainer at each stadium to call a medical timeout if a player appears to be disoriented. During the Super Bowl, and we talked about this, the hit on Cam Chancellor. But the thing about it is, he remained in the game, and that was his choice. Under the new rule, a spotter at the game would communicate with the side judge if it's determined a player is showing obvious signs of disorientation or is unstable. Neither team would be charged for a timeout, and teams can replace the affected player only during their stoppage. The opposition also would be able to substitute a player to match up. NFL Competition Committee co-chairman Rich McKay said Monday that the Edelman situation was among those that they looked at when proposing the change. This is a direct quote by him, folks. It came a little bit from the Health and Safety Committee just saying, we've got these spotters, they've got a really good vantage point, they've got technology in their booth, they're communicating pretty well with our traders and doctors, and we've got a pretty good rhythm going there. Why would we miss a play when a player should come out? This is totally understandable. Um, there's been a lot of rule changes going on in the National Football League. Um, if you haven't really been paying attention, the game seems like it's really changing or it, the sheet's being pulled right from underneath us. Um, you know, it is one of the five safety enhancement rules approved by the owners on Tuesday. They also changed the rules for appeal back block to include all offensive players being penalized as opposed to just those inside the tackle box. That's very interesting and integral right there, folks. They have also added the rule of protecting receivers, extending the protection if the pass is intercepted and the, and the intended receiver remains unable to defend themselves from a hit. They made it illegal for a block in the back outside the tight end area to chop a defensive player engaged above the waist by another offensive player. Pushing a teammate at the line of scrimmage on punts and field goals also will be made illegal. Quickly, folks, and, you know, that I've been getting asked a lot of questions. Are these new rule changes good for the game? Are they bad for the game? I'll first start with the first question. Um, you know, is the new rule for the disorientated players, is that good? I can agree with that. I think that is, um, you know, good. I, I don't know about the line judges and things like that. I think sometimes it, it's seeming like the NFL just really wants to slow the game down um you know i i don't really see maybe so much of the need for that you know i think maybe having somebody in the box who can communicate with some of the athletic officials on the sideline would be okay but you know getting specific as to having vantage points and, th and saying things like that i don't think that's really all needed but i can say for myself and having my own personal um you know situation or issue with this kind of topic in high school i received the concussion myself and, you know, it happened during practice before the next game I wasn't supposed to play. And I snuck into the kick return huddle, and I took back the opening kick return. Not for a touchdown, but um, I ran it back significantly. That was high school. But the thing is, um, our trainer, Doc, was heavily upset at me. And I didn't understand why, because it was my choice to go back in the game. So, you know, I, I understand about the rule changes and things like that. Sometimes I just wish that these owners would take a, take into account how the players feel. You know, sometimes I feel like they should bring – I know they have the NFLPA. I know about the National Football League Players Association and things like that. But it's just seeming like those guys don't really have a lot of power or, you know, the power that they thought they have. Because if they did, they would be included on, you know, some of these rule changes. Um, you know, the defensive – uh, the defenseless receiver, the peel back blocking, you know, some of those things, blocking in the back, you know, blocking in the back is illegal. We've always known that. So there shouldn't be a rule change about that. Um, but, you know, some of the plays as far as blocking and some of these new rule changes, they're really slowing the game down. And I, I don't I don't know how that's going to make the game look in the next five to ten years. You know, I know it's not as gritty as it used to be, but at the same time, it is NFL. It is a heavy contact sport. So. People need to understand that these players sign contracts, they go through waivers, and they go through all these different ordeals. They have to understand the consequences. You know what you're getting yourself into, and you know you know, you know not the possible negative issues that can come from you know helmet-to-helmet -helmet injuries or any injury for that matter, but 
you know, you take that risk and you understand it's your body. And, but once you've gone through the process, and that's why I can't so much agree when I see players who have been retired and things like that, and they try to sue the National Football League um, for some type of revenue because of sports injuries and head injuries and things like that. I'm not saying that, you know, neck injuries, spine injuries, you know, brain injuries, um, junior Seau type situations, you know, those weigh, weigh very heavy on my heart. Um, you know, as a former player, you know, I love football. You know, I'm, I'm just a fan of it. So, you know, I want the longevity of the game to continue into the future. Um, but, you know, there, there's going to always be people that say, you know, they don't want their son playing football or their nephew or, you know, things like that. And that's perfectly understandable. But at the same time, we also need to understand on the other side of the fence, folks, that these players make these choices. So if they're the ones playing the game and you're the one making the calls, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you should be more willing to provide some input from the NFLPA and not just from players who are out of the league. You know, there's always, I, I can never understand this, you know, even since I was, you know, a, a young boy, how guys who don't play create and make and try to dictate the rules. You don't play anymore. The game is not the same as it was when you played. So, you know, to have these, you know, these former NFL players and things like that on the board and them deciding and making the rule changes, even the owners, the owners aren't out there playing, the players are out there playing. So you have to respect them, you have to respect the bodies, and you have to respect what they're putting their bodies through. So, on that note, when it comes to the rule change, do I agree? Anything that'll make these players safer, I do agree. But at the same time, you know, as being a former player, I know what it means to take it to the, you know, take it to the limits every time, not have, you know, any recollect, uh, recollection about what you're actually doing to your body, not really take into account the injuries that you're sustaining during a game or practice. You know, you just keep going on to the next play because that's what you're trained to do. You know, so issues like this are going to keep, um, you know, keep popping up here in the future um, and for years to come because you know the game is changing the players are changing the game is becoming more faster different positions are being utilized more than ever so you know on that note folks we'll see what happens in the future but for now I can say that that one solo rule I can agree with but some of the others you know some of the others I just I just don't know right now I just I just don't know but, you know, for the fans of the NFL, you keep watching and you keep understanding. But, you know, you have to understand that these guys are grown men and they're going to make whatever decisions that they want to make. And on that note, folks, we're going to switch it up a little bit and we're going to head into some NHL talk, folks. Yep, yep, you heard it. You heard it here. NHL talk. And I don't want any, you know, anyone to think at all that we on Q and A discuss topics that we don't know about. I myself grew up um, playing ice hockey. There was an ice hockey, well, ice skating rink, literally in driving distance, right down the road um, from my elementary school. So I actually went there throughout a lot of my childhood. Played a lot of ice hockey, um, a lot of roller hockey, and things like that. So. You know, I'm really a big fan of the NHL. Um, not so much of the fighting and things like that. I think some people just watch it for that type of action. But, you know, they have a great playoff format. I love their point system and things like that. So, right now, folks, I just want to talk about, you know, some possible matchups heading into the playoffs. Um, how some teams are looking. How teams are looking in the standing so far. So, if you haven't been keeping up with it, so far, you know, we have the same couple of teams who are on top, who have been on top. In the Eastern Conference, um, we have the at excuse me, the Atlantic and the Metropolitan. Montreal is, in, is ahead of the Atlantic, um, you know, 46 wins, 20 losses. 100 points right now is looking like the best. And you really can't, you know, be mad at what they're doing, especially at home. They're 24, 8, and 5 at home. 22, 12, and 3 on the road. So, 
to me, you know, the Canadians are a team that, you know, they're always being talked about. They're always seeming to lead in points. Um, and they just don't play out there. You know, the goals against the first overall 2.1. Penalty kill percentage is seventh overall, 84.4. Um, you know, you just, it's hard to say. You know, it, it's really hard to say. I love the Levy Lounge. Um, I get a lot of my information from Mr. Levy on his site um, and on his radio station and things like that. So I listen, and I've been listening for the past couple of years of all the talk and hype that the Canadians have been receiving and I've actually been watching a few of their games, and they can back it up. They have some big players. I mean, really, you know, the division that they're in is not extremely the strongest. You have Tampa Bay right behind them, 46 wins, 21 losses, 99 points. So you have Detroit with 90 points, Ottawa with 85 points, Boston with 84 points. But after that, you know, really, you start getting to the Buffaloes and the Torontos and the Floridas of the world. I mean, 33 and 26. 27 and 41, 20 and 46, you know, 60 and 47 points right now. They're not really going to make any noise going into the playoffs. For me, the Canadians are looking really like the favorite coming coming out of the Eastern Conference. Of course, you have the NY Rangers, you got the NY Islanders as well. Both of those are New York folks, I know. Pittsburgh, I'm you know I'm always seeming to watch them and, and seeming to wonder what they do. Um, but to me, you know, Pittsburgh is a team that they're always so streaky because you really never know what they're going to do. I mean, or who's going to lead them. Alexander Steen, you know, it, it's hard to say. You know, they he rallied, you know, they helped the Blues win in overtime. He got his 24th goal of the season. Um, but, you know, with them competing against the Penguins, I'm just not sure. I mean, I love Sidney Crosby. I think he's a phenomenal player. Um, but, you know, to me, what's going to get Pittsburgh over the hump is, you know, their goalie, who you could possibly call the best goalie in the game right now, Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, you know, 32-16-8 and eight on the win-losses during the season. Um, goals allowed 2.22, save percentage is 92.3. Um, you know, for the career it's 91.2. So, Mark Andre Fleury's been in the league 10 years. He's phenomenal. Um, you know, he's very active in the goal pit. I just don't know if they're going to get enough os- offensive play to take them to the next level, and that's going to be strictly off on the on the shoulders of, of Sidney Crosby. Um, Really, out of the Metropolitan, the New York Rangers are making a lot of noise. 99 points, 46, 19, and 7. Um, you know, we know what they can do. Rick Nash, 63 goals. Um, left wing, you know, their third in goals per game, three. Goals against, 2.3, their third as well. Their eighth in penalty kill percentage, 83.7. Um I just, you know, heading into the playoffs with the NHL is always so tough for me to cover because it's about hype and who's playing the best coming into it. But at the same time, it's really just about who takes it to you. You know, who provides the first knockout blow, who can hit their opponent the hardest in those first couple of games and really just kind of make themselves lose. You know, it's it's I just don't see a whole lot of teams coming out of both these conferences. Anaheim is one of my favorite teams. Um, that is my favorite team in the NHL. I love what Vancouver is doing. I love what St. Louis is doing out of the Central Division. Um, but quickly, you know, just to get and give some easy picks, um, you know, going into the playoffs, you know, future matchups... It's going to be hard to discuss because we know the point system is going to change in these next couple of games with people winning and losing. But as of right now, my favorite out of the Eastern Conference in the Atlantic Division is Montreal, the Canadiens, and the Metropolitan is definitely the New York Rangers. In the Western Conference in the Central, 
this is really tough for me because as much as I want to pick the St. Louis Blues, something is telling me that the Predators are going to be a team that comes out of that Central Division. They're second right now at 45-21-8, and eight, and I'm going to actually pick them to come out of the Central Division over the St. Louis Blues. In the Pacific, we have Anaheim, we have Vancouver, um, you know, Calgary as well. They really kind of, you know, Los Angeles and up. You know, Los Angeles has 86 points, Calgary 86, Vancouver 90, Anaheim 99. So as far as that goes, you know, in the Pacific Division, I guess I have to really give it to the Anaheim Ducks. They're my favorite. They're 40, uh, excuse me, 46, 22, and 7, first in, this, in the Pacific Division. So the question here is, folks, and the question I've been seeing a lot is, you know, who's the favorite just heading into the playoffs, heading into the championship in no, you know, specific order or specific conference or things like that. And to me, you know, it's the Canadiens. And then it's everybody else. You know, I think they're just playing phenomenal hockey right now. Um, you know, I'm always watching out for Pittsburgh. I'm always watching out for the Capitals as well. Um, you know, just because, you know, I, I'm I'm just such a huge, big fan of Alexander Ovechkin out of the left wing. Um, you know, 2.8 goals per game. That's eighth. 2.4 goals against power play percentage folks is 24.9 so 25 percent on the power play that's some good work right there but for me you know when you have everybody else in that metropolitan division that's doing well like the new york rangers the new york islanders and pittsburgh pittsburgh and washington are always two teams that always seem to get in each other's way there's always been that Sidney crosby alexander ovechkin comparison and matchup so i think it's going to probably come down to that again but as of right now, you know, I think it's the Canadiens and then it's everybody else. Um, I don't see anybody that's in the 100-point range right now in any of the divisions. So I'm definitely going to have to give that to Montreal as we head into the playoffs, which will be starting soon. Let's see how much time we have left. Not a whole lot of time, folks. I just want to reiterate one more time for you that you are listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University's student radio station, the most illustrious, innovative, and intelligent sports radio show on the airwaves today. I don't want to touch on this subject too much, folks, because there's still so much room left to go. But there's some big stories coming out of the NBA right now with Dwight Howard possibly coming back and returning tonight. The thing is, folks, I don't know if that's going to be good or bad for James Harden. For me, I honestly and personally think that it's going to be bad for him. Why do you ask that? And the question that's been asked a lot is, will the success of James Harden continue as long as Dwight Howard returns and the thing is folks I don't think it will continue I know James Harden is going to continue to score on a high level but at the same time you know I, I really think that he is going to be somebody that clogs the hole for James Harden James Harden is a slasher um, you know he's definitely somebody who loves to take it to the hole and get the and one or the foul call if he can um, but you know, for me, you know, I just think he's gonna. I think he's gonna be somebody, you know, that really clogs up the hole and provides a problem for James Harden. Because if you see a lot right now, there's a lot of James Harden dancing around. There's, you know, he's crossing people up and he's doing a phenomenal job, folks. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not discrediting James Harden or his game in any way. He's clearly he's clearly the best shooting guard in the game right now. But I don't see them going deep into the Western Conference. Um, you know, even I mean, not even just getting through, you know, the West, but, you know, these last couple of games, you know, even if he returns, I think it's going to be very tricky for them, you know, to be collaborative, uh, collaborative on offense and to, vi you know, find a common sense or a common identity for that offense. You know, they can't really strictly highlight the pick and roll with them as strictly their only base and means of offensive scoring. 
you know, I know Patrick Beverly is somebody who's hurt right now, but they're going to definitely need some big play from Josh Smith as well, who is somebody who's kind of found his role with that team. But at the same time, and, you know, we saw this with LeBron when he took the Cavs to the finals versus the Spurs in the early 2000s. You just can't win in the playoffs doing it alone. You have to have some type of help. You have to have, you know, not necessarily a big three like Miami had, you know, when they made their runs to the finals. But you have to have some people who can, you know, when James Harden is not on his game, you have to have somebody who can step it up and can put the uh, put the ball in the basket, you know, maybe take some charges, you know, just get his team hype enough to win or take it to that next level. You know, to me, when it comes to who can – Who's the best one-on-one -on -one player who can take their team to the next level without any help? And that comes down to James Harden of the Houston Rockets and Russell Westbrook of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Both of them are playing respectively alone. But for me, I have to give that edge to Russell Westbrook because he doesn't – I mean, of course he has Enos Cantor, you know, but with Serge Ibaka being out, he doesn't exactly have anybody who's going to clog up that lane. And they know to get out of Russ's way – when he's charging with his head down with the ball in his hand. So for me, you know, I don't I see James Harden still having continued success and longevity. I just don't know about any more of these forty or fifty point games. You know, I'm seeing maybe, you know, twenties and thirties of course. You know, he'll probably average in the thirties of course. But I just I think that Dwight coming back is gonna dampen what Houston is trying to do heading into this Western Conference matchups in the playoffs. They're not going to be able to beat a team like Memphis. They're not going to be able to beat a team, you know, definitely not like Golden State. Um, you know, I, I even think they might have trouble with the Clippers, you know, if they were to play a team like that. You know, it's just hard to say when you look at the Houston Rockets with Dwight Howard because we've seen them so long without Dwight Howard, you know. So right now it's really just James Harden's team. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with it, but I'm really nervous for, you know, what's going to happen to James Harden's game. I really think that as of right now, and not just to start an MVP conversation up again, folks know we've been talking about that, but right now, folks, the MVP is really looking at Russell Westbrook. I know he's missed a significant amount of games. That could be the only reason why he doesn't get it and we've talked about that talked about that on the show as well but you know if he can take those Oklahoma City Thunder to the playoffs without Serge Ibaka without their leader Kevin Durant the sniper and cerebral assassin that he is you know I definitely think that it's his to lose but on that note like I said that Western Conference I mean excuse me the, the, the Western you know it's it's just it's so deep with teams that I just can't fully trust Houston with Dwight Howard. You know, he could possibly get hurt again. You know, I just don't really know what's happened to Dwight Howard. You know, I used to think that he could potentially be one of the big best big men in the game. Um, but, you know, he he just seeming like he's gonna forever be on the same caliber of uh I'm not comparing him to this guy, but you know, some sort of like maybe a David Lee, you know, somebody who you know, who had some good years, had some big years. You know, we saw him in the dunk contest and what he could do back then with Orlando and things like that. Um, but, you know, he just doesn't seem to be right right now. It seems to, you know, be a little bit more about the outside of basketball, which, you know, that's perfectly understandable. You know, you get your money and revenue however way you can. Um, but, you know, it, I don't really think being one of the greatest big men of all time is something that Dwight Howard wants to do, or I guess something he really can do, folks. I'm not hating on him at all, but I'm just so concerned about James Harden's game, um, you know, when he comes back. You know, like I said, Dwight Howard's return is looming. Um, you know, they play tonight in New Orleans, and this could be the return of Dwight Howard. Um, you know, they intend to bring him back from uh, now that I read this, a 26-game absence. Um, limit him to possibly 20 points per game in the early stages. He's having knee troubles, folks, and we know what that does for big man. Howard's not played since January 23rd, um, but Houston has maintained its standing as a top-four team in the Western Conference without its defensive anchor. Um, and this really alone, like I said, bolstered the MVP case 
um, for the Rocket stalwart James Harden. You know, they're 17 and nine since Dwight went out. Um, you know, Kevin McHale told reporters that you might see Dwight sooner rather than later. Um, he said last week that he expects to be restricted to 20 to 25 points per game until he can build his endurance and that he won't play in back-to-back games. But, you know, I don't know. They have some good help on that team. They have Corey Brewer. They have Josh Smith. Some of those uh, some of those boys, you know, could definitely play. But competing at the same level of James Harden, it's going to be very, very, very tough to do. Um, so on that standpoint, will James Harden or the Rockets continue their success with the return of Dwight Howard? I don't think so, folks. We'll have to see for ourselves. I'll definitely see for myself. Um, hopefully, he, hopefully he returns to action. Um, but strictly on that idea alone of James Harden continuing his success and the Rockets continuing their success, um, there's not that many games to go, so... If they can keep riding the horse that they're riding with James Harding leading the staple, I definitely think so. But I can definitely say in the test that Dwight Howard will mess up the chemistry and flow of the Rockets just because that's the type of player that he is, folks. So we'll see tonight. And, you know, heading into the playoffs is going to be very tricky. But stay tuned and we'll see. Um, You know, really quickly, I want to talk about this before we go. This is... Staying also in the NBA realm, but um, Steve Nash has decided to retire. And, you know, mm, this is such a touchy subject for me because I used to be such a big fan of Steve Nash. Um, You know, but these last couple of years... And I understand age, I understand things like that, but, you know, you know how your body is feeling, you you know that. So, I'm kind of upset, you know, I think Steve Nash, I kind of look at him, I hate to really come out of my mouth and say this, because this guy did win back-to-back MVPs in 2005 and 2006 with the Phoenix Suns, but he really looks like a money-hungry quitter right now, and I, I hate to say that, but... It's, it's, it's just tough, folks. It's, it's tough. You know, he's known since October that he'd play his final NBA game. His body simply couldn't bounce back anymore. Um, this is the quote. I really thought I was going to get through the year. Nash said Tuesday, I did everything I possibly could. I think I was in a good shape as anybody through training camp. But when I woke up the next morning, it was a mess. That's when I really started thinking long and hard of what I'm really capable of this year. Um, no, I, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm not discrediting anything Nash has ever done. The only thing I can say that, you know, 05, 06, either one of those years, Kobe could have won the MVP one of those years, but that's, we'll save that topic for another day. But, you know, Steve Nash is 41. You know, he announced, he officially announced his retirement on Sunday in a letter to his fans in the Players' Tribune and a Sports Center conversation with ESPN.com's Mark Stein. You know, I just, I don't know, man. You know, I definitely think he's a Hall of Famer, maybe even first ballot because of the back, the back MVP years, because of what he's, a, what he's done for the point guard game, for the assist game. Um, you know, he, he, he really paved the way for a lot of point guards. You know, a lot of point guards probably don't know it, but they mirror their game after Steve Nash. You know, but I don't know. You know, after he left Phoenix. I just think, you know, it was about getting paid as much as he can um, before it's time to leave. And, you know, I think Steve Nash has known for a while now that he that he wasn't going to play. Um, you know, I know that he got injured and things like that, but I think even before the injury, he was maybe having some preconceived thoughts about it. So, you know, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't rock with Steve Nash on this one, folks. So, I don't know. You know, question is, is, was it good or bad for him to retire? It's definitely good. You know, I think it's only bad because he could have done it a few years ago. And that and that's really, you know, something I want to talk about very quickly, folks, because, you know, I used to be a big, big fan of Steve Nash. And 
he's kind of been thrown into that plateau of players who, you know, and I understand, you know, not understanding that it's your time to go and understanding that, you know, your reign is over and, you know, I understand how much you, you know, these players probably, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine playing in the NBA, but, you know, I know it's something that they're extremely overjoyous about and I, and I know they're proud of it, but, you know, when you know that you can't do it anymore, you got to pack it up and you got to, and you got to give it up. You got to throw the towel in or not even throw the towel in. You know, it, it doesn't always have to be about quitting or giving in. Sometimes, you know, your, your body just, you know, it, it, it's time to go. It just tells you it's time to sit it down. So, I think Steve Nash heard his body talking to him, but I think he heard those dollar signs more. And I'll just leave it at that, folks. I want to appreciate everybody tuning in today. We'll be back. We're on a 24-hour hiatus. We'll be back on Friday. You were listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University student radio station with your host, Addison J. Taylor. I want to thank my station manager and my program manager, Leah Thomas and Will Clark, for doing what they do best. We have an array of shows coming after me, great ones before me as well. So like I said, folks, I'll see you on Friday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be blessed.